You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. I want to be the title sponsor. What's it going to cost? I think around 10 million. Yeah, I, I, that's a bit out of my budget. I have the impression that we are in the place where we have to be now. Greg had a really bad back all last week, so we caught up on your podcast with really? me giving him a back massage and him listening to you guys. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful image. <laughs> with exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. My name is Richard Moore. I'm with Ciro Scognamilio. Uh, hi, everyone. And I have no words to express my satisfaction to be here with you also this year. Well, it's great that you're kicking off the 2016 podcast, Ciro. Not joined this week by Daniel Freib and Lionel Burney. We'll be back with them next week. But we are in Mallorca at the Team Sky Training Camp, one of a few training camps that's been going on. I was at Etix Quick Step the other day. We'll hear some interviews from there later in the show. Have you been at any other training camps as well? No, for the moment not. This is the first one. But I have to ask, dear Richard, okay, we are in Mallorca, as you said, and we are working. That the two lazy guys of Lionel and Daniel, what are they doing now? We are working. They're working on other projects, Chiro. Uh, Daniel last week was at the Giant Alpeson team launch, and we'll be hearing from him about that with some audio from there as well. Um, Lionel is just working on other secret projects, I think. It's secret also for our listeners? It's secret for the moment. We'll also hear in this uh, show from Mark Cavendish, who's joined Team Dimension Data, of course, for 2016. And I went up to Manchester to see him last week. But we're at Team Sky. We're going to be speaking to some of the riders, hoping to get an interview with Elia Viviani, your countryman, Chiro, later on. You and me and him, perhaps, a little three-way round table. Why not? Why not? Uh, for him, uh, it will be really a key season because uh, he remained really disappointed four years ago in London because he tried to take a medal in the Omnium and he arrived sixth after a good race, but at the end he arrived only sixth and so in Rio this year uh, he will try to take a medal in the Omnium, but but there are also some interesting news about his program of 2016. For example, he will participate for the first time in his career to Paris-Roubaix. Well, w- I mean, I'm looking forward to, to speaking to him because he was a, a real uh, star performer last year for Team Sky, won a lot of races. And I would, might even put him as favourite for the Omnium, which Mark Cavendish, of course, is targeting in 2016. Uh, it should be quite a good event that in Rio Cavendish still to qualify but Viviani looking very good for that and he's getting a lot of support from Team Sky to go for that as well Chiro before we go in there and do some interviews and get out of this terrible wind um, you had some news on Pippo Pozzato which is a great way to start 2016 uh, I mean as usual Filippo Pozzato is capable to remain in the headlines also if he doesn't win the races. I mean, we have to accept that this Pippo Pozzato is a kind of star and in Italy, yes, as you said, he appears in the news because uh, a guy from Sicily, a 25 years guy, uh, created a false identity on the web in order to chat to nice girls and he called himself How Filippo Pozzato. Somebody has stolen Filippo Pozzato's. This is in the Italian news today. They've stolen his identity in order to meet women. Exactly, exactly. I don't know if someone in the future will stole his identity also to become a cyclist. I don't know, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> maybe not, dear Richard, because especially in this second part of his career, maybe <laughs> victories aren't arrived with so frequently, but why not? Have we had a reaction from people Pozzato to this? Uh, uh, yes, I said? immediately wrote him a text message and I must confess that he answered almost live immediately. So maybe he's very busy or maybe not. He answered immediately. And uh, well, he underlined that this guy, uh, after he, um, he tried to do this uh, identity with him, he, he, he changed identity because Pozzato discovered him and uh, he uh, changed the identity in a famous Italian actor of red uh, lights, hard films. 
Okay, so. I think we know what you're getting at there, Chiro. So, so it's 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 resolved. Pozzato's not being his name is not being taken in vain anymore. Pozzato is alive and fight with he's, us. He's free to carry on his very successful cycling career. He's got two more years anyway, hasn't he? Two more years with uh, Southeast, and maybe in the future, uh, who knows? Maybe a career of. Uh, about uh, as Hollywood stars with uh, an Italian team manager that uh, our loved uh, listeners uh, know well. Who knows? Okay, let's head in there, Chiro, and do some interviews. It will, and you'll hear some, some audio from the interviews we're about to do, and a bit more later on, say from Mark Camdish and others. Let's do it, shall we? Let's do, let's do. Thanks. And we'll return later. Okay, I bumped into Sir Dave Brailsford, Team Sky principal, who's just signed up Chris Froome for another two years. That's good news. Dave, we're in Mallorca. This is a place you come to every year for the Team Sky training camp. Can you explain how it works? Because it, it, it's a bit different to most teams' training camps. What's the what's the thinking behind it, and how does it work for the riders? Well, it comes to this time of year. Well, I say this time of year. It's obviously the, the late autumn, and, and as the, the guys start to think about the season ahead and, and kick back into training. And um, when we thought about it, rather than do the sort of traditional couple of weeks block here and a couple of weeks block there, um, we decided that um, we'd come here and try and get a hotel, take it over exclusively, and then keep it for a couple of months. And, and we managed, so we, we've got our chefs here, we've got our staff here, and, and, the, and the hotel would actually be closed if we weren't using it. We've got a great uh, relationship with the owner. And then we see it really as a, an opportunity to be a, a couple of things. One, a bit like a drop-in centre. So, that, so nobody's forced to come for a period of time. Um, but obviously the weather's pretty good here. So at any time, if the guys in, in Northern Europe or any parts of, uh, you know, at home, training at home, have got bad weather, experienced bad weather, they can drop in, you know, fly in, fly out. But also, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity for us collectively to sit down and spend quite, um, quite a chunk of time um, either with new riders integrating them to the team, with, with um, new staff integrating them to the team. We do a lot of planning at this time of the year. So from a staff point of view, you know, we do all, all the analysis of the tour, the Giro, the classics. We do a lot of background work um, because it's one of the few times of the year when we can all collectively be together for a, you know, quite a sustained period of time. So I'd say probably 80% of our planning for, for any season is done in this period of time. So we've got some, you know, obviously new riders and, and getting them into the team and into get to get to know the other riders is really important. It's a great opportunity to do that here. So um, that's what, what are your first impressions? I mean, the big, the big sign is Mikhail Landa and Mikhail Kwiatkowski. What are your impressions of those guys? How are they settling in? Uh, very well, I'd say. I think um, it's been interesting over the years. Um, I think probably one of the things I'd say is that, you know, when we started out, you know, we've got pretty much uh, an Anglo-Saxon culture, detailed you know we, we work in a certain way and I think maybe I'd, I'd look back in, in in hindsight and actually think you know maybe with some of the um, uh, guys from the Italian guy different you know sort of more of a Latin culture if you like maybe the Colombians and some of the Spanish I think you know ultimately it's our job to try and get the best out of them and I think you know the, the differences in culture is an interesting one because I think you can try and force people to fit into our culture and say that this is where it's going to be or actually, you can think about what's going to get the best out of them, and and, and I think that's where you've got to give a bit of, be a bit more flexible in terms of trying to actually let's understand their culture, understand how they tick, and what's going to work for them, rather than imposing our culture on them, which is I think is a the kind of natural thing to try and do. And, and in light of that, that's why we've got you know uh, Zabian, who's a, a Spanish coach. You know, we thought actually there's a lot of that cultural kind of element that you know would be a, a great assistance. So it's got quite a lot of Spanish-speaking riders, and of course the Colombians. So and that's helped us tremendously in terms of um, helping to integrate uh, the guys. So, uh, to come back to your question, I think for the, for the Polish guys, so, uh, Mikolas Golas and and, um, and uh, Killer, as we call him, um, you know, they fit in absolutely. It feels like they've been here forever. You know, great. You know, they're, they're structured. The language skills are fantastic. They 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 great characters, and they've just fitted in brilliantly. For the Spanish guys, I think they come in with a slightly different, you know, they take the time, they, they ease themselves into a situation, they watch and, you know, it's a different a different approach, a different culture and, and we recognise that and um, I really, I'm impressed by the Basques, I must say, of all of the different nationalities that that, that I've worked with over the years. I think, the, you know, the, the Basque guys, are, 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 they've got a fantastic work ethic, 
their knowledge and sort of education and um, understanding of cycling and, and, and where it fits in their culture is is brilliant, you know. But their work ethic is phenomenal. They've got a brilliant work ethic, and um, they're pretty straight guys. They tell you how it is. And uh, so I really like the Basque guys, I must admit. Well, you've so got quite a contingent of Basque. How do you stop a clique for me with, with those? Because they're, they're quite quiet. You can see they're comfortable with each other and, and maybe not so good at mixing with the rest of the group. How do you, how do you stop them? How do you integrate them into the, into the wider group? It's always going to be a challenge, and, and, and it is a challenge because obviously people are more comfortable speaking about the mother tongue. And, you know, it's interesting that the... the, the, the the Spanish guys after dinner, they'll they they used to go and slower over dinner. They'll they'll all hang around after dinner and chat, and you know they got they they got their own way of doing it. But equally, we do impress on them that it's um you know we are an English speaking team, and, and it's uh you know this team is uh it that's that is the 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 mother language of the team, and it's, it it is ultimately it's got a British heart as well. And I think if you know that you're going to go to a British team, um then I think it's, it's incumbent on you to learn the language, and I think that they all recognise that. And um, and when they're in a group, there's one. They're really, really good, you know. And, um, and I think you know, Lander speaks fantastic English. He really does. Um, and so does Bennett. You know, he's 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 really he's really making a big effort. So, you know, it is a danger. But I think you just pull them up and remind them, and and um, and, it, and it can be managed pretty easily. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for the Cycling Podcast. Before coming over to Mallorca, I was in Calpe in southern Spain, a very popular winter base for lots of teams, including Etics Quick Step. I met uh, their new signing, Marcel Kittel, for a, an interview that we'll play in a future edition of the Cycling Podcast. I also met Dan Martin, another new signing, and Brian Holm, the sports director, who has worked for many years with Mark Cavendish, but won't in 2016 with Cavendish off to Team Dimension Data. So spoke to Brian Holm about life without Cavendish and Dan Martin about life in the new team and here they are now Brian Holm followed immediately by Dan Martin. Well it's a bit more quiet now you know like since Kev has gone <laughs> less noise I mean for the first camp December you realise it's a new team but like after two weeks you know it's a bit of like getting back in the sort of the same family. You're, you're, you're joking about Mark Cavendish but you must, you must miss him you've worked with him such a long time you've known him for so long, your your friends as well. Do you do you miss him being around? Yeah, I mean, he was always like uh, working with Kev. Trust me, it's never be boring. So, so that was a big big chance, you know, not having Kev. You know, like uh, he was always moaning about something, not in a good way, you know. But he, I was sure, sort of miss him, yeah. Uh, Patrick Lefebvre said that one of the jobs for the team this year was to put Marcel Kittel back back on the rails, as he put it. What's your what are your impressions of of him? He obviously had a lot of problems last year, um, but the, the athlete that you've been working with for a few weeks now is he somebody who you think is you know ready to have a a, a season like he had in 2014? That would be easy to say. He's going to be the same. He looked really strong here. I mean, with training, he's strong and uh, he's healthy. So say you're gonna have the same season winning two, three, four stages again. I mean we don't know, yeah. I mean I mean Greibel gonna win, Kev, Kittle gonna win, I suppose, and uh, we have to wait and see. But for the moment, luckily everything is calm now and stable on the right track, you know. So uh, I don't know really ha- honestly I really doesn't know what happened with Kittle last year. There was a lot of the rumors he got a virus, he was sick, he was starting training too early was making me more tired, you know. I actually I just know what I read in the papers, you know, and I uh, spoke a bit with the team. They say he, he was training too little, too lazy, and uh, I I think when after a few months in the season, we see who was right about that, Christian, you know, so it's not going to be long discussion. <laughs> Is it a risk taking on a rider who's clearly very, very talented, but has had such a, a bad year, you know, and, and, and an awful year last year? Is, is, there a, is there a risk in that? I mean, it's probably a risk with any rider, isn't it? You're, you're taking on that level. I mean, we, I suppose, maybe I hope it's a better chance. Um, such a year, I think it's a bigger chance you're going to have a hell of a year. And, you know, he's riding good because he's a winner. Like you saw him in the past winning, you know, he was like, he was bloody strong, wasn't he? How he won, you know, and uh, after, I suppose, 
after such a year, he want to put something straight. I mean, our team, I think we showed the last few years, we're going to win one way or another. We're we always winning. You know, I'm not too worried about that. And I think I, normally he's got a, like, a good inf influence on the riders, you know. So, like, normally riders coming here, I think we've got always like 14, 15, 16 different riders winning. That's a good, good, good signal, you know. Eh? So, it's like you're getting into a good circle and... Uh, I hope like Kittel gonna be a part of that, and uh, Dan Martin, you know, and uh, I was gonna ask you off Uran and Kwiatkowski as well, but is Dan Martin a, a good replacement for both those guys in a sense? Dan Martin is a light version of uh, Valverde, I think. He's good from February to October. He's always around, and uh, uh, Kwiatkowski, of course, he was a piece of art. I mean, he was just good kid. He's so talented, queer. He was very, very liked in the team also. And of course, I was very sad also when I realized he was uh, going to Sky. But that's life, you know. And uh, but on the other hand, I was happy when I realized because I called a few times my colleague Johnny Wells. I was asking uh, Johnny Wells from Garmin about uh, Dan Martin, and he was like, honestly, he's also one of his favorite riders to work with, you know. Very talented and very uh, hard training uh, gentleman. It was said to me before that this team is like a big family, and it really is. The, with the director's kids, apparently, apparently, you know, it's, just, uh, it's a really nice atmosphere. And it must be a big contrast. It, it's a very, it seems on the outside at least to be a very different kind of team. Obviously, I'm, I'm not speaking from experience of many teams, my second team, you know, but yeah. definitely from the outside, it does come across as this super professional and maybe a, perhaps a bit cold team, but once you're in the inside, it's like, it's, yeah, incredibly familiar. And, uh, yeah, felt feel at home right away and it seemed to have slotted straight in. There's, it's interesting when Patrick Lefebvre was talking about, you know, the policy of one out, one in, and the, the name he mentioned was Rigoberto Uran. I, that, that was surprising. I would have thought Mikhail Kwiatkowski was a more obvious um, guy. Well, you kind of, you're kind of a combination of the two of them in a way. You're Maybe you're, you're replacing two riders. Perhaps also it, it kind of says where, where Patrick thinks I'm headed. I'm getting into the prime years of my career now and yeah maybe my future does lie in Grand Tours so we, don't, we don't really know yet and uh, yeah I've made the move up to Andorra now so I'm, I'm spending a lot more time in the mountains just before it was always short climbs and maybe that's why I excelled on them but I definitely won't be leaving my, uh, my favourite races the Ardennes alone anytime soon but, uh, but yeah I'm not ruling out the question of becoming of going back to my pure climber roots and yes yeah, and just seeing how far I can go one of the, the aspects last year at Cannondale Garmin was there, there seemed to be a lot of pressure on you and, and maybe Talansky and you know there weren't the, the sort of huge array of stars that you've got here as you look around and see you know Tony Martin, Marcel Kittel, Tom Boone and all these guys how does that make you feel does that give you sort of comfort or is there, is there, is there a different kind of pressure that comes with that? Oh, for sure you see how huge this team is and the media attention it gets and yeah, there, there is a certain amount of pressure, but I mean, even last year, I never really felt that much pressure. The team's, teams are always very good at, at guarding us. And I also, I think it's how your personality copes with it too. I think it's very much a, a case of, it, it's a personal confidence thing that we're in this situation for a reason. It's because we're, we're good bike riders. And that's the reason we're in this team. That's why everybody, every, every rider here is in this team, because we're all good bike riders. And it's, we're, uh, the objective is to win the, win the race as a team. And whoever that might be, it's as long as the team wins that's important that's an important thing and that's what makes it like perhaps takes the pressure off a little bit here because you have even if, if you're on a bad day mm -hmm. there is somebody else to pick up the baton and, and at least have a crack and yeah that's where it's i find it comforting it's also a case of like going into a race one week stage race tour de france whatever instead of looking at the start stage of 21 stages and saying right we've got five six opportunities as a team to win this team we go in and we can almost win every stage there's a possibility on every stage and there's an objective on every stage and that's what's so exciting yeah, so you're still maybe figuring out exactly where your, your, your future ambitions will be but Julian Alaphilippe is a rider who also shone, shone in the Ardennes Classics last year is he somebody who you know quite well have you got to know him you know, in, in your time with the team so far I actually talked to him before, like before his successes in the Ardennes last year. You know, I knew, him. and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a friendly person, so I talk to people in the peloton, and yeah, he's uh, we get on really well. And he was even more excited when he found out I spoke French. You know, so it's uh, yeah, it's we already have a good relationship, and I mean, together with Bob Youngles as well, we're like it's gonna be really exciting the Ardennes because I think even though we're we're free riders who are very good at the Ardennes classics, we all have different kind of attributes and different strengths that. 
complement each other well. And I think we can uh, we can definitely yeah, it, it can be an exciting set of races because as I say, we can if it depends depending on how the race pans out, we still have a chance of winning. I mean, this is a team with a great tradition in the in the classics and. The Grand Tours have always been something that you sense that Lefebvre has been keen to, to crack, went close with Uran. Is that something that you've spoken about him with him a lot and, and was that a factor in you joining the team? Not really. It's been uh, it's more a case of me coming to the team and I think Patrick still sees a lot of progression. Even at the age, like, I'm 29 years old now, but he still believes that I haven't fulfilled my talent and made the most of the talent that I've got. And that's why I came to this team because I believe this is the place that I can actually get the most out of myself and then that's that's why we do this you know it's to, to push ourselves physically mentally and I believe this is now the right environment for me to really uh, yeah get to that get get to the level that's possible and perhaps fill in the gaps that my Palmares is missing at the moment and, and just finally Dan living in Andorra there's quite a few riders live there do you train on your own or do you train in a, in a group I mainly train on my own I think I'm one of the few guys who actually doesn't leave Andorra to train. I kind of stay in Andorra all the time and up to now anyway. And yeah, it's just uh, that was the reason I went there. So I kind of realised that I wasn't being exposed to the amount of metres climbing that I perhaps needed. And I definitely put down my success, my relative success in the Vuelta Mountain Stage. I felt so strong in the, in the climbs. And I think that was down to making that move in, in kind of early last year. and yeah just spending time riding up and down mountains all the time and then yeah at the end of the year after a crash in the Vuelta I'd uh I went back there and just did three weeks riding up and down mountains you know and it, that even that gave me the strength to be almost competitive on Lombardia and it was without racing for four or five weeks and I was still near the front ish until like kind of 50k to go so it was um yeah I think, I think it's it's gonna be interesting to see what impact that has on me this year and having that one year of living relative altitude and like and climbing up and down mountains from the cobbles of belgium to the tops of the alps you're listening to the telegraph cycling podcast with richard moore lionel burney and daniel freed back in majorca at the team sky camp i spoke to elia viviani the team's italian sprinter who had a great season last year and is planning a very busy spring he's off to the tour de san luis in argentina to ride for the italian national team then on to Dubai, Het Newsblad, Kerner Brussels Kerner, World Track Championships, Terreno Adriatico, Milan San Remo, Gent Wevelgem, E3, Tour of Flanders, Pyro Bay. It's a very busy spring indeed before he has a little break before the Giro d'Italia and then begins his preparations for the Omnium at the Rio Olympics where he hopes to challenge for a medal. And one of his main rivals there could be Mark Cavendish if he qualifies for the Olympic Games. Both taking very different approaches. Cavendish has been in Manchester for three months training more or less exclusively on the track and I met him in Manchester before I travelled out to Spain uh, so let's hear from both of them first of all Viviani speaking at the Team Sky training camp in Mallorca and then we'll hear from Mark Cavendish in Manchester here they are you had a great season last year lots of wins a lot of your wins come very late you know you're a rider who seems to not necessarily need a big team around you but you, you seem to just be able to time your effort and you've got that that late kick is that does that come from the track or you know is that just something that comes naturally to you yeah sure sure from um, it's from uh, from the track because uh, when you don't have a train sometime i have a train same in dubai last year when i have uh, garen thomas ian standard luke grove uh, handy fan swifty yeah here i can have one one maybe of the best train train lead out in the world but sometime i have sometime i don't have and when i don't have I need to understand when is the moment to to go, uh, when, which one is the best wheel to follow, who is the rider in the top form in this moment. You need to understand what all these things, and uh, in one second you need to decide what you need to do. No, and sure the track helped me in this, because in the last K you have a lot of situation. You need to change tactic in pam. You are, you need to do are ready. And uh, sure, the track can help me for that. Is the team supporting you, your ambitions for the Rio Olympics a lot? Are you get, being given a lot of time to prepare properly for, for the Omnium there? Yeah, with the team, also what I do in 2012 with Canada, we, we plan the first part of a season completely for, completely for the road season. 
and uh, we know when we see the road season, we say which one is your focus, Elia? Okay, not to the France because we go to win this Tour de France with Froome. And the good thing is the Olympic is after the Tour de France, and uh, sure that is a good thing. My big focus is Giro d'Italia. You want to try to the classic? Yeah, we try to the classic. And for the first part, I do the track words, but not with specific work. And uh, the team support me after that, because after the Giro d'Italia, we make, we make a line. They don't put, put uh, in my program a lot of race on the road. And I have all the time I need for prepare the Olympic. But uh, yeah, we have uh, a big focus for the first part on the road. Mm. And after that, we have two months and a half for the, uh, where I do sure altitude and uh, a lot of training on the track for improve in what uh, what I need to improve. So well, kilo and... Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a very competitive Omnium. We saw Mark Cavendish recently in Manchester. He's been living in Manchester for three months yeah. and, and compromising you know, his road training. He's not been doing a lot of road riding at all, just training on the track. Are you surprised at the focus that he's putting on the track? Yeah, uh, I'm lucky because I prefer to do the first two big event in finish October, 1st of November, and then do not compromise my road part, road season starts. And uh, with this point for the Olympic ranking, I am quiet and I need I don't need to go to another World Cup. And I hear I'm really really happy for that because if Saint Cav sure. I think he compromised some some preparation for the road because if he do really three months in uh, in Manchester only for the track, sure when you come back to the road it, you can you can win sure the the sprint stage, but uh, you suffered a lot on the climb you suffered a lot in the I think for example a week uh, race same terreno no and uh, which the level is really really high no sure i think uh, cow can win in the start of the season uh, stage at dubai or santur or where uh, where he go but uh, sh the problem was if he want to win milano sanremo or is same this mm. i think it's really quite difficult yeah i'm surprised yes and not i think a lot of this because uh, when i see cow on the track and see he really determined for that and uh, i think wow I try to understand and after uh, I think, I s yeah, it's good because uh, if I think Cav, uh, I think he is the best sprinter in the world because if we see his Palmares, he win all, I, all is in, in my dreams. So every sprinter want to win Milano Sanremo, he win, he win 26 stages in Tour de France, he win, he win Green Jersey, he win in Giro d'Italia, he win Red Jersey. He win Kurm Kur and a lot of other classic. Also, he win the words on the road, the words on the track. So, if uh, he understand, uh, he have uh, the occasion to take a medal. I think the Olympic was a unbelievable focus for the uh, all the sportmen in the world, not of not only cycling. And uh, if he is he is really determined, I think. Uh, yeah, he's a good, yeah, good yeah. one for the Omnium. <laughs> yeah, well, who, what would you rather win? The, the gold medal in the Omnium or Milan San Remo? <laughs> for this year, gold medal in Omnium. Okay, so you'll leave Milan San Remo yeah. for another year. Finally, Elia, who is the greatest Italian sports journalist? <laughs> <laughs> good one, this one. Whew. Yeah, I think uh, Ciro is on the top. Yeah. I see a few times Chiro because from when uh, when I arrived to the uh, team Sky, he is the only one come no yeah, yeah, yeah. from the Italian and uh, yeah I think from Team Sky Chiro. <laughs> Mark, you've been you've been up in Manchester for a few months now. I mean, you've got a lot of history here. Uh, has it felt on any level? Has it felt a bit like being back? You know, in, in the days when you you lived here and part of the academy. No, absolutely not at all. Um, Tracks act has completely changed since. Since I was there, the structure of British cycling's like, really changed since I was here, and um, I was on my way up in them days as well, you know. So yeah. What do you mean when you say it's changed? What I know you you mentioned the gears and things like that, but in what other ways has it has the sport changed? Well, it's just the two events now. In Olympics is the two events, and the 
it's quite ridiculous actually that like an omnium features in the endurance and three of the omnium events or sprint events and three it's just you got completely it's really it's pretty odd i didn't realize how much of a full-time job the track was now you can't it's not riding your bike it's like a rally driver and a formula one driver like they can drive cars and they'll do it both of them would do each of them pretty fast but I think they couldn't. You, sort of a guy couldn't specialize in both, really. You know, mm. and uh, that's how, how are you approaching it? I mean, are you are you training for each event? I mean, how how are you spreading the the training out, and who's looking after you in that respect? Yeah, um, in the endurance kind of events, the road riding takes care of itself. Like me as a road rider, as an endurance rider, as a four-year-old rider with a base, that takes care of itself. But uh, in sprint events, the kilo the flying lap um, and even the team pursuit it's so so specialist now that you know you can't actually train them properly unless you're fresh and the thing is you can't get fresh unless you rest up mm. and then to rest up you're kind of missing out on endurance training it's kind of a vicious cycle that you really have to to balance quite yeah, intricately I mean, you're you're sort of entering uncharted waters here, doing this sort of preparation. You're going to be obviously riding on the road with your new team, going for the the Olympics as well. You've made the decision. You're committed to it, but it's almost like an experiment in a way, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, I did try last year in uh, in the Omniums during the season. They were to get qualification points so I could ride the World Cup as well and actually I came off the back of them quite well I actually did not great in the sprint events but always got it back in the in the endurance events and the new format the Omnium with the points race at the end is suits an endurance rider down to the ground but uh, obviously you don't want to make too much time up so uh, actually I know that the lead up to the Olympics is not a big problem it's getting selected for the Olympics. Mm. That's that's the bigger problem, you know, and uh, that's quite a short-term thing. But I don't want to overdo that with detriment to later on in the year, anyway, you know. Mm. So I've got, um, you know, the guys at British Cycling, Shane Sutton, Heiko Salzfeld, the guys that have known me my whole career, and the guys I had big influences on on my career. Heiko Salzfeld got me my first pro contract mm. with Telecom, you know, and Shane was there for everything for the whole academy for everything saw me grow from a track to road and they know what I can do they know what I do especially when I have a number on my back and and that's great presumably I mean the guys who you'll be up against in the Omnium um, a lot of them will, are, are road riders the likes of um, Viviani Gavira presumably as well um, but those guys won't have they've not dedicated the last three months to this sort of training will, might that give you an edge when it when it comes to it? no they didn't need to dedicate it because they interspersed the their year with with track riding anyway like they're not paid seven figure salaries you know so they don't they can just take time off from the from the road during the season and do it whereas I haven't been able to do that the last ten years you know um, so that's why I have to put a big block in in the winter really to do that you know yeah. they qualified before I'd even started my qualification process you know so yeah. they didn't need to put a big block in during the winter really yeah. And the new team, you've had sort of one get together with them, is that right? You you had a get together mm. okay. last year in Cape Town. You know, you've been you've been in a few teams now, but what what's it like? What's the feeling like joining a new team? Is it excitement? Is there a bit of uh, trepidation? You know, that you're in a new environment, albeit with some familiar faces. But what what's the what are the feelings like joining a, a new group of people? To be fair, I was more nervous when I joined uh, Omega Pharma Quickset because I really didn't know anybody you know I knew a couple of people but especially the guys I was racing with I, I was real new to the environment and uh, it was a team with a primary language that wasn't English that's the first time I'd been on that and it was a it's a prestigious team and it's a prestigious team that really had its traditions and its roots and so I really felt I was coming in and that was a bit I was a bit nervous there for the first few months but uh, here uh, at uh, Dimension Data and race with 
a third of the team at least I've been teammates with and a lot I've been racing with my whole career as well you know and uh, I got some great friends there mm. and uh, and actually it was it was brilliant we had a great time like uh, we trained every day when we were there but it was kind of like being on a on a cyclist stag do for a few days you know um, it was we really had a good laugh the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, brought to you by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist. Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk free for 30 days. Okay, so it's been a bumper interview edition and the extended jingle you heard there was for our sponsor Trainer Road sponsoring us throughout the winter myself and Lionel have been following their training program religiously we'll be updating you on that in a couple of weeks I think the effects of my Trainer Road training were much in evidence today when we did our team time trial I'm joined now by Orla Shinui and Chiro Scone Emilio is back as, as I say this has been a bumper interview edition we've heard from Dave Brailsford Brian Holm Dan Martin Elia Viviani Mark Cavendish, and now two more superstars, <laughs> Orla and Chiro. So earlier today, uh, on the Team Sky Media Day, we did a, a bike ride, didn't we? But it was it was a pretty competitive affair. It was a bike race. We were told specifically in the team meeting this morning, the briefing, that it was a race, not a ride. So we were all taking it very seriously. Well, Chiro was team a DS, race. I should say. Uh, Orla and I were riding. I mean, this is something they actually did last year. They They took the journalists on a bike ride stroke race. I, I think, it, I don't know if many other teams do that. I think it's quite a good thing. Last year we went out with the riders themselves. We left the hotel. We, we did the briefing with, with the riders, went left the hotel with them. I think it was quite a good icebreaker. I think a lot of the riders appreciated seeing journalists out of their comfort zone a little bit. And it, it, a broke, little bit. it broke a few, broke down a few barriers. We didn't ride with them today, but we did do a race with some of the Team Sky st- staff and it was good fun wasn't it? It was fantastic fun, it was really hard or maybe that's just me but it was really good fun, as you say a really good icebreaker brings everybody to the stage of the day when it comes to the interviews that m- that much more relaxed the riders know we've done it even though we didn't do it with them so that kind of puts them at ease a little bit as well and yeah it was just, it was just really good fun Chiro, you were a DS, you were my DS, you were very confident we were Dave Brilsford was in my team and, and four other journalists uh, and we, we, we disappointed in the end. We lost by 25 seconds. Brilsford unshipped his chain on his fancy bike. That's your excuse. <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, also I was a little bit disappointed at the beginning because last year as DS, my team won. And now <laughs> as a DS, my team arrived second. But you know that I'm not the brain for nothing. And I say that this defeat will become a victory in July because the goal is in July and not all even in, not in January. No, it's January. It's not in January. We'll but come back stronger, won't we, Chiro? Yes, uh, but um, as you know, as every year, my goal, my main goal, is to stay as long as I can near the beach. And I, I want to thank Team Sky because they organize always this media day near the beach because Tayro Hotel is near the beach. So fantastic! Good goal stuff. achieved. That's an early season goal victory for sure. So Chiro. we came out and the serious stuff began because we did our interviews with. Uh, Froome, Brailsford, Mikhail Landa, Mikhail Kwiatkowski. We spoke to all these guys. Um, it was also announced that Froome... What's that, Orla? Kwiatkowski. All right, like all right. Jeez. <laughs> Honestly, are we going to have another season of that? <laughs> no, we're not. You're just going to get it right this okay. time. <laughs> Kwiatkowski. There we go. Okay, uh, we spoke to all of them. It was announced that Froome ha- has signed a new two-year contract. Dave Brailsford also told us he has also signed a new contract up to the end of 2018. Now... What do you think Froome is on? I was wondering this today. Long salary here, by I, the way. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still chesty from that damn team time trial. Um, are you being serious? Are we going to Yeah, discuss yeah, yeah, because okay. I've, I've had a little tip off. Oh, you cheeky monkey. I would have said then probably let's go four, four and a half million. million. Yes, that's my that's Oh, my yeah, point. four million is apparently the figure. Four million a year. Get in. I said my guess was three million. 
Well, I I think he was on close to three million already. It's a lot of money, isn't Peter it? Peter Sagan was a lot of money for riding your bike. Million. <laughs> well, I mean, you've got to compare it to other sports, though, don't you? And and he's worth that, isn't he? Don't we think? Because I'm worth it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, dear Richard, it's always a question of proportion. I mean, you say, for example, three millions. Well, it's a big amount of money. But for me, it means nothing because, Richard, I want to tell also to our listeners that to live the life that I like, I simply don't, in, non, I simply don't need <laughs> money. I think so g- for me, the three million, <laughs> one, two, what, it's nothing. I mean. the, que- the question is, what is Chiro on? Well, exactly. any, other, any other takeaways from today? Any other nuggets? Nuggets. Uh, you think, I, I chicken, have to say, the funniest, the funniest thing was we, I was doing the interview with Dave Brailsford with Chiro, and Chiro was had his headline written already. Team Sky, <laughs> yeah, okay. Team Sky are the Barcelona of cycling. <laughs> he he was trying to put these words in in Brailsford's mouth. He kept saying, "Would you say Team Sky are the Barcelona of cycling?" But but you know, but would you? But would you? You know. If, if you would help me out here and just say that <laughs> Team Sky are the Barcelona <laughs> cycling, Do you have yeah, just you. and he he said um, he said no no I would say we're the Derby County of cycling. Half an hour later, I wandered up to Chiro and he's he's hunched over his laptop <laughs> and I have a look at the screen and he's got there the, the Wikipedia page of Dar- <laughs> Derby County Football Club. That is research a la Gazeta de la Sport. Oh, they for leave you. no stone unturned. <laughs> but for example, also I maybe I could. Uh, could also have the possibility to have Derby Country in the future of my screen saver of my laptop. Who knows? <laughs> Why not? I mean, Why not? Why not? Why not? And um, the one thing I would take away from this trip actually is the, on a more serious note, gentlemen, um, the leadership position of Chris Froome, given the um, two year extended contract, the confidence that he has in himself to. to commit himself to the team now for the next two years the fact that he's got teams guys backing what I noticed as well chatting to other guys like Kvitovsky and Landa one of the first things they said about the reason for coming to Sky was that they really wanted to learn from riding alongside Chris Froome now given the leadership battles that we've had really within the team uh, until this year really um I think that that really bodes well for his position. I think that everything he's learned over the last year um, at the Tour de France in particular, everything he'll have gained from that and everything he'll have gained from the failure of the year before stands him in extremely good stead to be a very strong leader. And he seems very confident um, and just ve- nice and comfortable with himself, I think. Maybe that's the OBE, but he, he's walking with a nice little swagger, I think. Yes, I perfectly agree, and I was reflecting on how uh, British fans are uh, um, lucky to have a, a journalist like Orla. But uh, um, I was thinking that um, in a few words, uh, when Team Sky started their experience in cycling, well, they started as the Bradley Wiggins team in a certain way. Brad was the, the iconic person of this team. Now uh, is no longer in the team and Team Sky now has the image of Chris Froome. That's, yeah, I think that's, that's true and, and um, he is, you can see he's got good relationships with quite a lot of people and mm, team exactly, riders and yeah, so on. Yeah. So listen, let's see that. We heard about from Team Sky. We, we've got more interviews from the Team Sky camp that we'll be playing in the coming weeks. Uh, next week we'll be releasing our first Friends special of 2016. It's Inside the Lab with Chris Froome. More Chris Froome. But that's my... I was with Chris Froome when he went to the lab for his physiological test. We've got a lot of interviews with Froome himself and the scientists from the lab on that day, and hopefully it's it's interesting. And that's exclusive to Friends of the Podcast. It's £10 to become a friend of the podcast, thecyclingpodcast.com. Our second Friends special will be a look back at the HCC High Road team and what happened Ooh. to that. We've got a fascinating interview with Bob Stapleton that Daniel oh, wow. Freeb did. It's really good. And lots of other interviews as well. And we'll be hearing from other stalwarts from the HCC High Road team. I'll be back in two weeks with Daniel Freeb and Lionel Burney. I'll be casting off these two 
<laughs> standings. No, 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 no I'm not. joking. You'll be joining us Coming throughout the season. Chiro, you're lucky to have a journalist like me. Yeah, no, we, we, listen, <laughs> hey, we, you'll be joining us throughout the season. I'll pay you the money later. You're, you're the extended... Euros are sterling. You're the extended family of the podcast. Uh, I mean, listeners, I only can say that this is only the beginning. You can't even imagine what we well, are going to do for the future. Well, the Giro is on our in our sites this year. We're going to do the, the Giro daily podcast at Giro. Chiro, you'll be joining us, I hope, on, on a lot of occasions at the Giro, if you're at the Giro. Uh, I will be there. Yeah, good. <laughs> the Excellent. What would the Giro be without <laughs> Chiro? I mean, without me, the Giro doesn't start. <laughs> so I have to stay no there. No Chiro, no Giro. <laughs> exactly. It's a t-shirt, I think. There we go. Brilliant. <laughs> so listen, sign up, become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. Not only will you get the exclusive friend specials on your mobile phone, but you will support this weekly free podcast. I'll be back in two weeks with Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. For the moment, thank you very much, Orla Shinawi. Thank you very much. It's been fun. And thank you, Chiro Scognumilio. Ciao, thank you. Thank you. But Richard, you should have said that you have to sign up again to be a friend of the podcast in 2016 because I was a friend in 2015 and sacrificed good nappy money, well sacrificed and well spent, but I didn't realise that I have to do that again in 2016. Oh, sorry, was that not clear? It wasn't clear to me, but um, I'm not the sharpest tool in the box, certainly not after a team time trial, uh, but it wasn't clear to me. Well, okay, so sorry, that, that should have been clear that even if you were a friend of the podcast in 2015, you have to re-sign as a friend of the podcast in 2016. It's £10 this year. Yeah, £10 this year. It was only five or last That's year. even more nappies. That's even more nappies, yeah. But it's worth it. It's just for you guys. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.